Okay, so this is the very first lesson of Math 30 3. What we're going to cover today is linear relations in both table form and in graph form. Uh, there's many different ways of representing linear relations. These two are, generally speaking, one of the more common ones, but also one of the ones that are probably going to seem more familiar to you. Anyway, I'll stop rambling. Let's get going. So, like I said, this is the very first lesson on Math 30 3. There's uh, four main things that we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about linear relations as tables, linear relations as graphs. We're going to talk about finding the slope of a linear relation. So again, that was like a rise over a run. You might have done that in uh, in previous math courses. Uh, and then the last thing that we'll do today is identifying nonlinear relations. We won't really have to do anything with those. We just need to identify when we have a nonlinear relation. Without further ado, here we go. Let's get going. So first of all, big question, the elephant in the room here. What are linear relations? Well, a linear relation is a relationship between two different quantities, or in other words, variables in which as one quantity, which is a quantity, not quantities, in which one quantity goes up by one, the other one goes up by a set amount each time that doesn't change. It's way easier to see this with an example. Uh, first thing to come to mind for whatever reason was a bag of chips. I don't really know why, but that is just the first thing to come to mind. What I mean by that is if you had one bag of chips, let's say that costs $3. Two bags of chips, that costs $6. Three bags of chips, that costs $9. You probably get the idea. As you increase the number of bags of chips by one, the cost of those chips in total increases by three. So it's a linear relation in that as one of the variables, in other words, the number of bags of chips you have increases by that certain amount each time, the other variable, in other words, the cost, increases by a different amount each time, as long as it's the same amount. You know what I mean? Like it didn't jump all of a sudden up by like four or, or it didn't go down or something like that. Uh, it's going up by a consistent amount each and every single time. Now your first variable, in this case, it was like your number of bags of chips. That really doesn't have to go up by one each time. It just makes things a lot easier if it does. Uh, there's a lot of linear relations you'll look at that will, for instance, go up by five each time, and then this will go up or down by some other amount each time. As long as things are consistent, as long as they're predictable, we have a linear relation. Anyway, hopefully that makes some degree of sense. Uh, so the next thing we'll talk about are just uh, the ways that we can express linear relations. There is actually four different ways that we can re uh, represent these. Uh, I know in Math 9, you learn a bit about these. And the way I teach this in Math 9 is I say the four different ways spell out GOAT, G-O-A-T. Uh, and that's graphs, ordered pairs, which is, for example, a coordinate like 2, 5. That would be an ordered pair. Uh, algebraically, which is always in the form Y equals MX plus B. We'll deal with that another day. We're not going to focus on that today. That's a little bit more complicated. Uh, and then the last one there, of course, tables. Really, the only ones we care about today are graphs and tables. Uh, both of those things are really connected. You'll see what I mean. So we're going to start with tables here first. Uh, on a table, so if you had a table that had a linear relation on it, on a table, you know that you have a linear relation if for each time your variable increases by one, your other variable increases or decreases by the same amount each time. So kind of like what we just said before with that bag of chips example. Uh, now, keep in mind, if it deviates from this even once, like if if everything on your whole list is perfect, but one of those uh, relations is out, then it's not linear, unfortunately, right? So a linear relation is one that goes up or down by the same amount each time, no deviating from it whatsoever. Uh, now, generally, when you have these, regardless of whether you have a table, a graph, et cetera, generally speaking, you're gonna have an independent variable and a dependent variable. Now, what an independent variable is, it's a, it's a variable that is freely chosen. In other words, you can control what's going on with that variable. You can increase it, you can decrease it. You're the one who decides what that independent variable is. That's what you're plugging into an equation, for instance, right? Uh, so independent variables are generally speaking the X value in an ordered pair. Uh, if you're not dealing with ordered pairs, they're still your X value. So they'd be your X value in your table. Well, more clearly, if you had a graph, just pretend that was a graph there, your X value goes along the bottom. So your independent variable will be going along your uh, your x-axis there. Uh, now, dependent variables are the other ones. Dep dependent variables rely on the independent variable. So in other words, as you change your independent variable, your dependent variable changes with it, follows what that change would be. Now, that's not to say that as your x goes up by one, that your y is also going to go up by one. But as long as it follows some predictable pattern, just like that bag of chips example, that's still going to be a linear relation. In that bag of chips example, just by the way, your X would have been your number of bags of chips. You have control over that. You get to change how many bags of chips you're buying. 
the thing that's responding to that, or in other words, your dependent variable, that is going to be the overall cost. If you are buying, let's say five bags of chips, you know, that was your independent choice. You bought five bags of chips. The dependent variable is going to be the overall cost because that's what changed. Hopefully that makes some level of sense. Now in this table that we were given here, it shows uh, Kalinda's earnings from babysitting. So her hours of work, what she can kind of control here, that would be her X and then her total earnings would be Y. So as she increases the amount of hours of work she does, that's gonna increase her total earnings as well. Now, linear relations can also be called a direct linear relation. Uh, this just means that the point zero, zero is part of the relation. So in other words, you know it's direct if you have, uh, if when, sorry, if when you have none of your independent variables, so if you didn't have anything in your independent, you had nothing in your X, that you'll also have nothing in your Y. That's just what we call a direct linear relation. Uh, the opposite of a direct linear relation is something called a partial linear relation. That's where even if you have zero as your X, you'll have something that isn't zero as your Y. Uh, we'll see some relations like that, because again, not all linear relations are direct, um, but it is what it is. I just threw that in here today because it, you know, it's just something we'll need to know going forward. It's not the end all be all. So don't worry about that too much. All right, anyway, that's literally all we got to say about tables, right? So a table just shows your X, your Y, there's not really anything too crazy about it. Graphs, on the other hand, graphs are a little bit more technical. Graphs consist of an X axis that goes along the bottom. I always used to think like X marks a spot on the ground, right? So X is along the bottom uh, and then a Y axis, which goes upwards. I don't know, someone, someone once said, oh, Y kind of looks like a tree. I don't know, I don't really see it. But again, they're like, oh, Y goes the tree. So it's standing upright, whatever floats your boat. I don't really care, right? Anyway, so your X axis and your Y axis, generally speaking, they should always be labeled. So you should always tell me what your X axis represents. This graph that I put on here is pretty good. It tells me my X axis represents a time in days. Uh, your Y axis, of course, should also be labeled, right? So your height in centimeters, that's all good to go. Uh, and ideally it should also have a title. I'm not a huge stickler on that, but it is still pretty important. If you put a title on there, someone can immediately like just look right at your graph and go, oh, I know what this graph is representing. If this one didn't have a title, if you didn't see that it said plant growth, you'd be like time, height. What is it talking about? Height of what? You know, nobody knows, right? So that's why it's nice to have a title on there. Uh, like I mentioned before, your independent variable goes on the X, your dependent goes on the Y, not a huge surprise. Uh, when graphing a linear relation, when graphing a linear relation, the graph will form a straight line. Uh, if it doesn't form a straight line, you don't have a linear relation. That's about it, right? So if you have a linear relation, it's gonna be a straight line. Awesome. Now, this is the real meat and potatoes of today. We gotta talk about slope. So a very important feature of a linear graph, and again, keyword there, graph, technically it is on a table as well, but it's way more clear on a graph. A very important feature of a linear graph is the slope. Uh, just like how you define slope just in general terms, like saying, oh, what's the slope of this, right? Or that has a really steep slope. Uh, the slope is just basically just how much it goes up for how much it goes over. A more simple way of putting that is rise over run. If you can figure out how much your graph goes up by, so if we're like looking at the start point to the end point here, if you can figure out how much your graph goes up by and then divide it by how much it runs, so how much it goes over, that number that you get is your slope. Now slope, generally speaking, can have units, but oftentimes it doesn't have units at all, right? We had units on this one, centimeters and days, so this would be centimeters over days or centimeters per day, um, but it's not the end of the world. Slope again, can have units in some contexts, other contexts it doesn't. Uh, so slope represents the rate of change of your dependent variable. So in other words, in this case, because our dependent variable is your height, this just tells us our rate of change of our height. So in other words, how fast our height is changing over time, right? Uh, now algebraically, we'll get to that another day. Again, this is talking about like that y equals mx plus b stuff. Uh, algebraically, the letter m represents slope. I don't really know why they chose the letter m, like I always imagined it just stands for like how much you're going up by each time, M for much, right? Um, but I actually have no clue, right? You can look it up. I don't think it's really the end of the world. Uh, but anyway, algebraically, the letter M represents the slope. So if you wanted a real algebraic way of figuring this out, you could say M is equal to delta Y over delta X. That's just a fancy way of saying a change in your Y divided by a change in your X, um, or perhaps, you know, I like this one a little more, even though it's a little beefier, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Uh, what that just means is if you pick two points, 
Again, I'll pick on this one. I'll say that's my X1, Y1. Uh, and then pick another point. We'll say that's my X2, Y2. You can find your slope just by going Y2 minus Y1 and then dividing that by X2 minus X1, right? I think it's way easier just to consider it as rise over run, especially if you have a, a graph, you know, seeing a graph and seeing how much you rise divided by how much you run by, usually it's not really all that, that tough, right? Anyway, hopefully that makes some sense. Perfect, all right, I was just wondering. I was like thinking, okay, you know what? I hope we find the slope of this graph because this is a good one. All right, so in this question, it's saying determine the slope of the following graph. We were like one step away from doing it in that past example there. So slope, again, is just rise over run. You can pick any two points on this. It doesn't matter. You can pick literally these first two if you really wanted to. You can pick the first one and the last one. You can pick like the first one and a middle one or like a middle one and another one. It doesn't matter. When you have a linear relation, because it is going up by the same amount each time, your slope is going to be the same. The slope right here is no different than the slope right here. All the slopes are the same, right? So bottom line is you just need to find your rise over your run. Personally, I always like picking my first point and my last point. I don't know why, it just seems to feel best for me. I don't know, I don't know, it's just my opinion. Uh, so let me start by writing rise over run. Well, between my first point and my last point, if we're gonna start by rise, I started right here, which looks like it's starting at one, and then it's ending way up here, which looks like it's up here between 10 and eight, so that'd be nine. So if I'm going from one to nine, think about what you're rising by there. Hopefully it's pretty clear. If you're going from one to nine, you're rising by eight. So our rise is eight. As for my run, notice I started in terms of my X distance here, I started at zero. So I'm starting at zero. And then I'm going over here, which looks like I'm going all the way over to eight. So if I went from zero to eight, that's gonna be my run. Maybe I should write this rise and this is gonna be my run. If I went from zero to eight, that just obviously means that I ran over by eight. So eight over eight. Well, eight divided by eight, big surprise there, that's just one, right? So the slope of my graph is one. And the next question here, what does this slope represent? Well, think about the fact that we did rise over run. The rise in this case was up by centimeters. So I'm actually gonna even adjust this up here. Eight centimeters over, as for my run, that was in days, right? So eight centimeters over eight days, that equals one. And then if you look at your units here, that would be centimeters per day. Right, so what does the slope represent? Well, if, if I have a slope of one centimeter per day, that just tells me uh, this plant is growing one centimeter per day, right? Centimeters over days, centimeters per day, right? So the slope just represents the growth rate in this case. It represents the rate at which my height is changing over time. In other words, what my dependent variable is changing over my independent variable. Hopefully that makes some sense. All right, here's another example. This one's a little bit more creative because this time around we give you the slope. We also don't give you a graph or anything. This is more like a real world kind of example. Let's say you knew the slope of a wheelchair ramp is 0 0.60. If it rises 150 centimeters, how far horizontally does it run? If you want, you can actually pause the video here and get this one a try on your own. Uh, you're just going to need to use the rise over run formula. But aside from that, I'll just go over right now. So again, remember your slope, slope, equals your rise over your run. This question becomes a little bit more like a, I guess we could call it like an algebra kind of question where we just have certain numbers and we wanna figure out the others. Uh, we know what our slope is. Our slope is 0 0.60. So let me write that in there, 0 0.60, that's my slope, equals, uh, we know what our rise is, our rise is 150. Uh, we just don't know what it runs by. So 150 over run. So 150 divided by something equals 0 0.60. Now you could play a guessing game all day on this one and say like plug in a bunch of numbers and hopefully find it. Um, but that probably will take you a bit of a while. So here's a bit of a reminder of some previous math courses on how we deal with something like this. If we're looking for run, notice run is being, uh, or rather it's dividing 150. So that's kind of interesting, but we wanna get run all by itself so we can figure out what it's equal to. Since we have 150 divided by run, how about we get rid of the divide by run by multiplying by run on both sides? Now bear with me on this one. If this seems a little bit weird, don't worry, right? Just hold on, okay? So I'm gonna multiply by run on both sides. What that does on the right side here is because I have 150 divided by run and then times by run, this times by run undoes the divide by run here. So in other words, it's just gonna knock both of these things out. 
Uh, now I multiply by run on the other side because I wanted to keep things balanced, right? If I do one thing to one side, I should do it to the other. So that way this stays balanced. So this gives me 0 0.60 times run equals 150. Now I want to get rid of this 0 0.60 because I want to get run all by itself. Now notice it's multiplying run. Well, ask yourself this, what's the opposite of multiplying? Hopefully you know it's dividing, right? So if we divide now by 0 0.60, what you do to one side of an equation, you should do to the other. This is gonna knock out the 0 0.60 over here. And this is just gonna tell me that run equals 150 divided by 0 0.60. Now I'm by no means a human calculator. I wouldn't be able to figure that out without typing one in. I probably have some guesses. It's probably somewhere around like 200 if you were to ask me, but maybe, maybe a little more than that. Let's find out. I'm gonna take my calculator. I'm gonna go 150 divided by 0 0.60. Oh, okay, I was actually kind of close. So it's gonna be run equals, I threw this in my calculator, it's gonna be 250. Now let's be real here. We knew the rise was 150 centimeters. So what do you think the run is in terms of units? Well, 250 should be centimeters as well, right? So in other words, as this ramp goes up by 150, it runs by 250, right? That's what gives it a slope of this. Rise divided by run, you'd always double check it. All right, anyway, we're almost done here. Okay, I think this is the last question. It's a couple parts though. We're gonna use that table that we saw earlier today and we're gonna throw everything we've done today together in one big question. Here we go. So the table below represents earnings from babysitting. Use the data to draw a graph. Should you connect the points, why or why not? All right, let's worry about the second half of that question afterwards. Let's start by just drawing a graph. Now, when you're making a graph, it's always really, really important that you draw an X and a Y axis. Now it's up to you if you wanna do it literally on the edges of this. I, for whatever reason, always like giving myself a little room. So I start in just by one. You don't have to, like you really, really, really do not have to. Uh, you could use the edge of this if you want. It's just a, a tendency of mine that I, I just kind of go inwards a little bit. Anyway, not the end of the world. So there's my Y axis. I'm also gonna do an X axis. I'll do that along here. There we go. Uh, notice that our hours of work that's what we have control over. So that's gonna be my X. The total earnings is gonna be my Y. Uh, so I want my X along here. Um, I could do one for each hour of work, but let's see if I could do like, okay, one hour, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hey, I could. What I just did there was I wanted to see, hey, could I space out my data a little bit? I don't like things too all tight together. Uh, I actually can, which is pretty nice. So I'm gonna say that this is one, this is two, two over more, that's three, that's four. That's five, that's six, and that's seven. Awesome. Now, in terms of my Y direction, you're gonna have a little bit more work to do. Uh, you can see our total earnings. It looks like we're going up by 1250 each time because uh, zero plus 1250 is 1250 and then another 1250, you got $25 and so on. Uh, so we gotta make a very careful graph here. I could cheat and literally say each one of these pegs is 1250. Like technically there's nothing wrong with that, but I think that's a, a little sleazy. Well, you know, actually, I was going to say it's a little sleazy, but I was actually going to end up doing the exact same thing. Instead of doing 1250, just because it's going to take a, like, a lot of room to write that, every two blocks, I'm going to say is 25 bucks. It's just going to look a little cleaner, right? So we'll say this is 25, two more blocks, that's going to be 50, two more blocks, that'll be 75. This one will be 100, this one will be 125, uh, and then this one will be 150. I think that's pretty much as far as I need to go. It's way further than I need to go, to be honest. Uh, anyway, let's start plugging these things in here. Uh, maybe I should label this though. This is our total earning, total earnings. And then this down here, I'm running out of room, but I'll just say hours. There we go. Hopefully that's readable. Uh, anyway, plug these numbers in here. So at zero hours of work, we have zero total earnings. How about I change my pen color too? That'll actually make this a little bit better. There we go. I'll just change this to blue. So zero, zero, we're gonna have a point right here. There we go. Then one, 12.50, that's gonna be right here. Two, 25, that's gonna be there. Three, that's gonna be there. Four, I think you can see the pattern already. Just follow them in as we go. Six, 75 bucks. Yeah, that's right, 75 bucks right there. And then seven goes up here. So there we go. We drew a graph, we got that all well and good. Now the second half of this question is asking, should you connect the points? Why or why not? Um, when you connect the points, if I were to connect these points with a line, that would tell me that this data is continuous. So in other words, you could work, let's say half an hour and make half of this amount, or you could work an hour and a half and make somewhere in between. Uh, in this case, I would actually argue you probably could do that. 
Um, but the reality is it's not going to be a perfectly continuous graph because, for instance, if you worked uh, instead of just an hour, if you worked uh, 62 minutes, so an hour and two minutes, they're probably not going to pay you for those extra two minutes. Um, so really, this is a matter of debate. Should you connect the points? Really, it's up to you. Um, but I would argue, yes, you probably should. So I will connect the points. Oh, that was miserable. Hold on. Let me try this again. I'll connect the points here. If you're doing this in person, make sure you're using a ruler. It makes it way nicer. That even still wasn't great, but you get the idea. Um, so why should I connect the points here? Uh, she could get paid for partial hours. In reality, she could get paid for like an hour and a half of work, or maybe even if she was really lucky, like an hour and a quarter, right? So an hour and 15 minutes. Um, but again, it's all up to you. If you argue otherwise, if you're like, no, she gets paid literally by the hour and then that's it, no, no questions asked, then I guess you wouldn't connect the points. Whatever, it's not really a hill to die on here. Uh, question B, what is the slope of the graph and what does it represent? Uh, to answer this question, I'd like to look at my graph again. Uh, the slope of the graph again is your rise over your run. Why don't I change my pen color one more time here? Change to green. Uh, it looks like the rise of my graph from my first point to my last point, my rise of my graph is however much this much is. We go from zero to, I guess, 8750. So if I go back real quick, if I'm going to write this rise over run, I know my rise is 8750 over my run. I'm just going to flip back here. My run is going from here, way over here. I went from zero to seven. So I went to, from zero to seven, oops. I went from zero to seven, that tells me my run is seven. Uh, now a slope should just be a number, like a fraction is all well and good and all, but I'm gonna find the slope as an actual number. So I will need to plug this in my calculator. 8750 divided by seven. Uh, oh, this actually doesn't give me, I was gonna say this is gonna give me a messy number. No, it actually gives me something very nice. 1250, there you go, that's our slope. So what do you think that represents? I already put a dollar sign on it. I think it's pretty clear what it represents, right? What this represents is how much she makes, who makes per hour, right? So in other words, the slope of this graph, in other words, the rate at which her total earnings are increasing over time, that's just her hourly wage. It's just what she's getting paid uh, per hour. Uh, question C, how long will it take for Kalinda to earn 150 bucks? Okay, so this is the real, the real question here. Uh, notice if she's getting 1250 per hour, that implies that it's 1250 times the number of hours. So we're asked how long, in other words, how many hours until she makes 150 bucks? Well, if it's 1250 times the number of hours equals 150 bucks, just like that old switcheroo algebra stuff I did earlier, you can get rid of this 1250 on both sides by just dividing by 1250 here, bam, bam, it's gone, and then divide by 1250 here. So 150 divided by 1250, throw that in your calculator. You're actually gonna find that, uh, maybe I should write it this, this way, number of hours. You're gonna find that the number of hours equals 150 divided by 1250. It's actually exactly 12. So in other words, after 12 hours, Kalinda will have made $150. Probably other ways you could do that if you really wanted to extend this chart, feel free. The table's there for you to, to work with. Uh, it's all up to you entirely. Uh, all right, the last thing we got to do today, I think I said the last thing was the last thing we got to do, but no, it wasn't. Trick, big surprise. This will go quick though. Uh, identifying nonlinear relations. So as you probably imagine, nonlinear relations don't increase or decrease by the same amount each time. They're not linear, right? They're not going to increase by the same amount, right? Uh, if you have a graph, nonlinear relations, clear as day. You can see immediately it's nonlinear because it will not follow a straight line. If you really wanted to prove it wasn't linear though, you could find the slope between a few different points. Uh, I won't actually calculate it on this one because I think it's a little bit too much, but if you looked at the slope here, clearly that's not the same, the same as the slope over here, right? This is a lot more steep than this line over here. And then this one certainly is even more steep still, right? So the slope between different line segments will change over time. If you actually want to do the algebra on it, use the slope formula, rise over run, all that, uh, you would actually see, yeah, the slope does change between those points and therefore it's not linear. Uh, all right, so here we go. The price of a car decreases each year by 10% of the previous year's value. A Volkswagen Jetta costs $25,000 this year. Make a table showing the cost of the Jetta over the next five years. Okay, this one's tricky because it says it decreases by 10% of the previous year's value. So a table is really going to be needed here. 
Um, so what I'll do is I'll say X is the, uh, that's gonna be the number of years, number of years. And I'm gonna say, Y is the cost of this Volkswagen Jetta, right? So here's my table. Now after zero years, so in other words, the price right now, uh, we got $25,000. That's the cost of this Jetta. Now, after one year, this is going to drop by 10% of that value. Now, just in case you forgot how to find a percentage of something, 10% is the same thing as 0 0.10. So if we go 0 0.10 times 25,000, that actually gives us what it's going to drop by. It's going to drop by 2,500. So since that's what it's dropping by, that's not the price of the Jetta in the next year, that's what it's dropping by. We'll just take that 2,500 away from 25,000. So if I go 25,000 minus 2,500, that gives me 22,500, right? So that'll be the cost after one year. We wanna do this for the next five years though. So we got a little bit of work to do here. So two, year two, it's gonna decrease by 10% of the previous year's value. So it's gotta decrease by 22,500, 10%, right? So 10% times 22,500. If you throw that in your calculator, unless you see the visual trick here, it's gonna be 2,250. Once again, that's what it's dropping by. So I gotta go 22,500 minus 2,250. This gives me 20,250. There we go. All right, we're getting there. So year three, now we have to once again drop the value. 10% times 20,250. That's gonna give me $2,025. That's what we gotta take away from that old price. So 20,250 minus 2,025 gives me 18,225. So once again, I went this number here minus this number here. Anyway, year four, we're getting there. It's gonna be 10% times 18,225. This is gonna give me 1,822.5. That's what we have to take away from that old previous value. Uh, so here we go, minus 1,822.5. This gives me 16,402.5, and I'm going to throw an extra zero on there because, you know, cents and all that, we, we want to have two decimal places there. So $16,402.50. One more time, we want year five. So year five, 0 0.10 times 16,402.2, or sorry, 0.5. Let's see if I can fix that. There you go, 0.50. Uh, throw that in your calculator. You're going to find that that's going to be 1,640.25. That's what we have to take away from that old previous cost, 1,640.25. Long story short, after five years here, the price of the car is $14,762.25. Whew, holy smokes, right? So those right there, those represent the cost of this vehicle as time goes on. Hmm, interesting. We're almost done. Don't worry. Graph those values. This is gonna be a little bit of a pain. Bear with me on this one. Uh, once again, I like making my graph where it's just a little bit inwards. There we go. And then another one over here, just a little bit inwards. Yeah, there we go. Uh, in terms of my years here, we're gonna say that this is one year, two, three, four, and five. Uh, in terms of my costs, in other words, in terms of my y-axis there, I'm just gonna flip back a slide. Uh, the highest cost is 25,000. The lowest cost is just under 15. So I want to say my highest cost of 25,000 is up here somewhere. So what if I said every two blocks is 5,000 bucks? 5,000, 10,000, 15, 20, 25. I think that's good enough. So we'll say this is 5,000. We'll say this is 10,000. Say this is 15,000. Say this is 20,000. And then we'll say this is 25,000. Uh, so again, we'll say this is the cost, and this is the number of years. Always important to label those things. Uh, if you're wondering how I knew how to make that, just by the way, it's a bit of an art. Like, it takes a little bit of time to figure out what works best. Really, it's up to you. Um, there's no right or, right or wrong way, really, of doing it. Uh, we want to graph these values, though. Uh, you guys should have the, the table in front of you, but I'm going to have to flip back. So 25,000 after zero years. So I'm going to put a point right there. That's all well and good. Uh, oops, and then I'm going to see after one year, uh, 22,500. That just so happens to be literally the in-between point between these two here. So I'm going to put that right there. That's not bad. Um, 
then after two years, 20,250. So it's a little above 20,000. So I'm going to put it, oops, wrong spot there. I'm going to put it right about there. Notice I'm putting it just above 20,000. I'm not putting it right on the line there. Uh, after three years, 18,225. That's uh, going to be about here ish, I would estimate. Uh, and then 16,450. That's about right. Oh, I'd say that's about right here. And then the last one, 14,762. That's just below this right there. You know, actually, after looking at this graph, it's not as crazy as I thought it was going to be. Um, we're not going to connect the lines here or the points here, although I suppose you could because I'm sure it decreases following the trend. Uh, but the question is asking, is this relation linear or nonlinear? How can you tell? Uh, what I was hoping for, it didn't work out as well as I hoped, what I was hoping for was that you see, would see that this is not a straight line. But this actually almost looks like a straight line, so it's kind of deceiving here. Um, if we we're really going to honestly answer this question as to whether or not the, the relation is linear or nonlinear, the best way would be to check the slope of each one of these line segments. So I'm actually going to do that. I'll do this on this slide just so we can see it. Um, we'll start with the slope between these two points. Well, the slope between these two points is going to be the rise over run. The rise in this case, we went down by 2,500. So rise over run equals down by 2,500. So minus 2,500 over how much we ran by, which was one. So that gives me a slope of negative 2,500, right? Now, the next slope I'm going to do is between these two, just for fun, the ones near the end. Once again, that's a rise over a run. To figure out that exact amount, let's just go back and look how much we went down by. Well, we went down by this 16 or this 1,640.25. So we went down by 1,640.25, but we ran this way uh, by one. So notice this time around, our slope was negative 1,640.25. Clearly, these are not the exact same slope, right? If they were the exact same slope, we would know that this is a linear function. So therefore, we know it's nonlinear. And this is because the slopes are different. Remember, always rely on your rise over your run. Whew. OK, so holy smokes, that was way longer of a video than I was hoping for. I apologize. Um, the good news is this course is not rushed at all. So that huge amount of information, you can kind of let that marinate for a few days. Uh, in the meanwhile, what we need to do for practice is there is a handout I've provided uh, you. It's got a whole sample of questions on them. I want you to complete all the questions on that handout. If you have any questions, please make sure you're reaching out and asking for help.